Okay, welcome to UVX Joburg. My name is Jonathan Copeland, and I'm a UX designer based in Pretoria, South Africa, as well as the host of the Guidelines podcast, and I will be your host this evening. If you guys want to send me any questions or get in touch, you can reach out to me on Twitter, at jmcopel. Now, before we get going, I'd like to thank this evening's sponsor, UX Joburg sponsor, which is Sand Dollar Design. Sand Dollar Design is currently running a promotion in which you could book a free consultation with their team of UX strategists, researchers, and designers to review your app, website, or system, or get advice on how to grow the UX maturity of your organization. You can request this consultation by visiting their website, sanddollardesign.co.za. Thank you, Sandola. Due to COVID-19, UX Joburg will be a remote meetup for the foreseeable future. Now, these meetups are going to be monthly meetups, which will last between one and one and a half hours. For each of these meetups, we're going to use topics that you have suggested, such as UX strategy, design thinking, and UX design in specific industries. This session will be recorded, so don't worry about not being able to remember something from this evening's session in case you forget. So sit back, get some coffee, and relax. You'll be able to find these recordings in one of two places. Firstly, UX Joburg now has its very own YouTube channel, so you can go there to find uh, you can go there to find last month's customer journey mapping UX masterclass presented by Yaku Fantenhefer. Now, we're viewing the, the YouTube channel as a long-form channel. Uh, the entire session is going, this is where we're going to post the entire session. This will be the introduction, the slides, as well as the Q&A section. We've broken everything up on YouTube using timestamps, so you can just skip to whichever content you're looking for. This is especially useful for, for example, last week's session, where we had an interactive uh, customer journey mapping session in Miro. So when next time you're making a customer journey map, you can go back to that YouTube video, watch it, and then re-watch that practical session again. Next up, we have UX Joburg's very own podcast. Now, you can find this wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Pocket Casts. Now, we've given a link to that in the show notes, so you can go and find it there, or just type in UX Joburg. Now, the UX, Joburg, UX Joburg podcast is opposite to the UX Joburg YouTube channel. This is where we post just specifically the snippets from the speaking session, the theoretical component of the UX Joburg meetup. So if you want to listen to just theoretical component, subscribe to the UX Joburg podcast, and then you can listen to that content again and again. Okay. Now, what would a UX Joburg now, what would a UX Joburg meetup be without a prize? And it's no different with this month's UX Joburg meetup. There are going to be 10 tickets up for grabs to UX South Africa's live stream event, which is going to be happening from the 1st to the 2nd of July. Okay, now you're probably wondering, how can I win these one of these 10 tickets to UX South Africa? The, the tickets will go to the most engaging questions and posts that use the tag at UX Joburg, at UX South Africa, hashtag UX Joburg. Now we've put those in the show notes so you can easily find them and, and use them if you'd like to ask a question. But if there's something that specifically stands out to you from the theoretical component that you've learned that's new in this session, feel free to post that as a post. But if you have a specific question that you'd like to ask our speaker, feel free to post that as well. And then we will ask them during the Q&A section. And either uh, if you've asked a question or if you just made a post, that puts you in, in a chance to win a ticket to UX South Africa from the 1st and 2nd of July. So please take advantage of this and get onto our Twitter channel. You can find a link to that in the show notes. Cool. So this evening's meetup is going to have three main components to us. First, we're going to have a theoretical masterclass then, we're going to have a Q&A based on the questions that you send in over Twitter, 
And then finally, we'll wrap up the evening with a networking session. So one of the best parts of going to a meetup is actually talking to people within your industry. And you can actually do that via meetup.com. We're going to show a brief video later that shows how you can actually um, use meetup.com to interact with people who are attending tonight. So we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, now before we get going, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Okay, drum roll. Today's speaker is going to be Gary Greenfield. Gary Greenfield is the co-founder of Interact, of, of Interact RTD and Papillo.io. So Gary is the managing director. Uh, and Gary started his career as a UX analyst in the late 90s and built some of, U uh, some of South Africa's first user experience design labs. He literally once had an ATM machine delivered to his lab. He's a type of personality, he's a, he's a type A personality, and is passionate about customer experience. Gary started off with UX before it became a thing. He started with customer experience business before that became a thing. And now he started a tech company that is going to be a game changer in transforming companies to be more customer centric. And with that, I would like to hand over to Gary. Gary, welcome to UX Joburg. Can we, can you hear me? Yes, how's it, Jonathan? Uh, uh, just give me one second. Let me just turn my, yeah, I'll share my screen. Just give me one second. <clears throat> oh. Okay. All right. <clears throat> just turning my video on. I don't know if everyone can see me. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary from Interact. All right, great. Let me my screen now, just give me one second. I'm just going to okay, great. Okay, is the uh, presentation showing? Great stuff. Okay, thank you, everyone. It's uh, it's a, it's a, it's great to be here, and 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 uh, thank you for everyone for joining. Um, today, I'm going to take you through my insights on, on user research. Um, so let's start off and uh, you can meet me. So thank you, Jonathan, for the stellar introduction. Um, but let me just give you a bit of a introduction about myself and then we'll get into what we're gonna talk about today. So, uh, so what can I say about myself? Uh, just firstly, that I'm the father of two twin boys. So if you hear screaming, if you hear shouting, if you hear something breaking or if you hear loud noises, uh, it's all part of the show. Um, I, uh, I'm the managing director of Interact, which I started in 2004 at the age of 24. Um, I think what I studied is not, in, is not important, uh, but more so that I've been co consulting in UX market research and CX for over 20 years, uh, mainly to large corporates, but also to smaller companies that uh, play an important role in our communities. Um, and I've been, I've been lucky to be involved in a lot of big groundbreaking projects that have really made a difference to, I suppose, the digital world in our in, in our industry, um, such as being part of the design team of the DSTV PVR, um, if you log into internet banking, shop online, book an appointment at your doctor, check in for a flight, buy an energy drink, I've probably had a part in designing and, and implementing a lot of those things. Okay, so just to start off, I just want to introduce my companies. Uh, um, I founded two companies. The, the first one is Interact in 2004, and the other one is Papio. Um, a lot of people get the pronunciation of the name wrong. It's actually Papio or, or, or Butterfly. I'm not, I'm, I'm not too great in my uh, in French, but uh, um, essentially it's about change. So I just want to go into why I started these businesses, because I think it's very important and relevant to our conversation today. So back here, when I started my, my career as a UX designer, um, a lot of the research companies didn't really understand digital, and uh, we couldn't really use the work that we were getting from them, and sort of the methods were quite antiquated. So, you know, what we, we started doing our own research and uh, found that what we were delivering was a lot more efficient and effective than what the uh, research companies were, were giving us at that stage. Um, and so we just started to start our own um, big research organization. We were also pretty forward thinking at that time. Um, and from my experience, we started seeing a lot of products and services being commoditized. So we wanted to focus on journey design through emotional engagement. 
Um, and at that stage in 20, 2004, customer experience was, was was not really on the on the map yet on anyone's radar. Um, but ultimately, our goal was uh, developing what most call loyalty, what we call expanded relationships through journey design. Um, one of our first ever business pitches for that for Interactor when we started it was to a bank where we where we proposed to um, turn their branches into coffee shops. So obviously that never happened, but uh, it was very ambitious at that stage. Um, then after 20 years of consulting, um, we've been running all these change all these journey programs. Um, and obviously one of the things that we found very difficult was how to facilitate that change within large organizations. And uh, we realized that we really needed the tech to help us facilitate that change because obviously large companies are very big, uh, big large companies are very slow at, uh, at turnaround and it's hard to move a large ship. So <clears throat> we were sort of tired of seeing our journey maps on the walls um, and wanted to see how we could make it a, a journey map in and CX design more uh, um, integrated into an organization. And uh, so we, we formed a tech company called Papio. And that really just assists you managing your, your strategic company change. Okay, so what we're going to discuss today, um, obviously, we're here because firstly, Yaku from Sand Dollar asked me to, uh, to talk about user research. Um, we are going to learn about different types of user research. I hope it's not going to, it's not very theoretical, but it will give you a good over, overview of it. But I also want to talk about our clients. I want to talk about why research is important. I want to talk, I want to give you some background into research. And then we'll talk about various methodologies that are out there and which methodologies are best to use for different uh, problems or different things that you're trying to solve for. Um, so we will give you some examples of, of research and practice. Um, so that's essentially what we'll cover. So bear with me, I'll start off with a bit of background and then we'll get into the actual research bit of the presentation. Okay, so the first thing is if we're going to talk about UX, we're in a UX meetup um, and UX in practice. The, the first thing that we need to obviously discuss is our clients. Um, and by our clients, I'm, I mean the end user. And uh, we can't talk about UX unless we truly understand and know these, uh, know these clients. Um, so just to give you an, just a thought starter, you have to look at a peop, all the people on this chat and, and on all the participants that are on this meetup, and you have to choose just one of them. And uh, think about how you would make a, a cup of coffee for this person. Um, and um, and what you would what you would make them. So the question that we ask is, would it be what they'd actually want? We all have our own preferences, and there's many variations of, of what we could make the, this, this person. So the point of what the point of this is is that we all want the same thing. We want, we want coffee. We don't. Uh, um, the difference is we just don't want it the same. Our needs wants desires, experiences, and backgrounds, all very different. One of the most loved co uh, coffee companies in the world today develops so many variations of coffee that they actually left out the humble Americano and, uh, in, the, in the first version of their menu. And, uh, you know, and that was by mistake, obviously, but it's an important lesson in learning that it's worth nice to deliver all these variations. It's uh, also nice to, we need to make sure that we're actually delivering to people's basic needs. Um, so that was just a, a small example. Um, what happens when it goes wrong? So this is just an illustration. It's a real illustration from one of our clients, and it's the way that they were segment, segmenting their customers. So it's a fictitious name, Glenn. He's a business owner with 600 employees, and uh, this is how they segmented their clients. So they, they segmented him into the 500 employees, 500 plus. They, they, they put him into a large business segment, and uh, their, their, their goal was to sell him enterprise business solutions. The problem with this is, is that Glenn had 20 based, 20 office staff based, well, they're based at the office, and the rest were all on site with no access to technology. So they were making assumptions um, on turnover, on size, on all of these things, and that's how they're segmenting and selling to their customers. But that is not who these companies are. Are, and that's not what they're about. So if we don't speak to our customers during our lifecycle design, very often we're going to end up not designing the right products 
or, or, or solutions to fit what they actually need. And that's the start of it. And I think it's a, a lot of the times when we work with our clients, this is the first thing where it goes wrong is who are your clients? What are their needs and what, what do they want? And I think it's a thing that a lot of companies struggle with. Um, and suddenly these questions come up when you're busy designing a feature on, a, on an interface or a product, you are uh, starting to ask these questions and then uh, it's kind of the wrong time because um, the, these questions are, are hard to answer and then it's not just so quick and easy to add into part of your d design process. Okay, so this word, user-centric design. Obviously, it's important because if it's, if it's, uh, it's not a user-centric design process if you don't involve your users. We hear this phrase a lot and it's mostly actually from our clients who, who refuse to sign up our budgets, but... Uh, um, we love them anyways, um, but it's our job to show them the value of involving your, your users in the journey, getting buy-in, and uh, ultimately just put in a, a framework in place to access users through your design processes. But it's not an easy understanding clients. Um, you know, your clients have multiple personalities, and it's impossible to design for all of these personalities. Um, but... The journeys will differ depending on who they are, not necessarily what they are. And I think that's very important. And that who and understanding that person is, is, is a big part of user research and, and, and what we're trying to achieve. Our clients and employees, and it's very important to bring in our employees because they, they're, very, they're very important as part of the design and the UX process. They change it. And uh, the mindset of the current generation is, they don't want to pay fees anymore. So that's not like in the old days where you pay, pay a blanket insurance premium every month. Um, and whether you get value from it or not, you still carry on, pay, on paying. People want to be in control. And it's a fundamental shift from, from where, where business is today. And business is changing. And we've seen all of these um, new great startups and startups that have purpose, startups that are challenging our bigger established companies. Um, their businesses are not just about profit, and they integrate better into society, and, and they also got the latest tech, which is, is something that a lot of large corporates and organizations struggle with. They also you know, understand the value of community-based and, ne and, and networking. Um, and obviously, there's more transparency that way, and new generations of people are a lot um, more um, aligned to this way of doing business and it's an, is a new way of doing business because it's typically not how we did business in the past. I just use these two examples here, Pineapple, an insurance um, startup. Um, they've got a lot of great initiatives um, in terms of their, their business. One is you can choose who you want to share your risk with, which is, which is an interesting concept. Um, the other is you, you just don't need to insure everything. So these days, it's not like you've got a house, you're going to have blanket household insurance covering all your items. It's about insuring things that are valuable to you. And that's talking to the mindset of our customers today and what they need and what they want. Lemonade, two things about Lemonade is a very interactive. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have, have, have been on there um, and, and, and seen um, their designs and, and the way they interact with their customers. But it's, it's, it's very forward thinking in terms of how they interact with their, their customers. No websites, forms, or anything like that. It's all based on, on, on chat and chatbots. And uh, also, um, they, they charge a flat rate and the rest goes to a good cause. And that's really where we look at our community-based type of initiatives and companies that are really in our communities and, and, and making a difference. Although Eliminate's not in South Africa, um, it's a very good example and a practical example of what we start tend to see um, with a lot of the startups that, that, are, that are coming into business um, these days. And very important now because South Africa sort of needs these young startups to really make a change, fight poverty, and promote social good in our, in, in our country. And uh, in clients, customers, or, or people um, will start navigating towards those type of companies. All right, so why is user research important? And let's just talk about user research for, for a little bit. Essentially now, we are more connected than ever, but at the same time, we're more disconnected than ever. 
especially now with COVID, we've all learned what it feels like to have social barriers um, um, in, in between us and, and other people. Um, it's been like that for a long time since people have been digitizing and, 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 the, and the mobile generation has been, um, has been um, coming through. But essentially, it's research, is, is, it's not about what we're designing for, it's about who and why we're designing. And uh, this just brings me to another illustration. Um, by asking why, Martin Cooper revolutionized communication um, as we know it. And, and he became the inventor of the mobile phone. Um, I'm sure you all know and are aware of this, this, this uh, illustration. But he was tasked by Motorola to build an innovative car radio. And he just didn't do what they asked him to do. He, he, he asked the question why, and that's the big part of research and what's important to research and, and why research is so important. And by asking that question, um, and the question was, why is it when we want to call and talk to a person, we have to call from one place? And uh, that then became, he became, then went on to develop the mobile phone. One thing about user research is that it's not the oracle. It's not going to give you the next thing, the best next thing. It's not going to give you all the great ideas. Your users are going to tell you what, what they need, what they want, um, and where your product is failing them, but they don't necessarily have all the in terms of what's next. And it is really up to you as, as UX designers and UX people and, and whatever your roles are to um, be forward thinking and create the what next based off what you understand about the audience that you design in for. Um, so our business environment, and it's very important because all of the research that we're doing is affected by the business environment out there. And you know, a lot of people talk about predictive analytics and, 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 and you know, you know, predictive research and, and, and all of those things. But the world is changing at such a fast pace, and no one could predict COVID and what happened to us, even though it's happened in the past. And uh, I'm not COVID, but but um, it's happened in the past. Sorry about that. Um, but our, our business environment is rapidly changing. Human interaction design is changing. So we're all digital companies now. It's hard to keep up. And we don't even know these days if we're chatting to a human or a bot. We don't know if we're going to have cash or bank cards in the next five years. Our business environment is tough. And everything that we do counts. So old ways of doing business is gone. Every idea, everyone in your business has a, has a great idea. Every idea costs millions of rands to implement. And very often, customers don't use what we build for them. Our customers are changing and becoming more complex. So here, the, their profile and, and their needs and goals have changed very much in the last 10 years. Um, they want to be seen as individuals. They want us to know them, but at the same time, they want us to respect their privacy. Um, but they want to be in co control of the relationship. And companies that are enabling that, companies that really, um, you know, are the ones that you really see are forward thinking and, and doing very well in, um, um, in terms of consumer markets. Um, customers, customer behavior is predictive and it does follow patterns. And often we don't, we don't, we don't actually, um, we don't use that information that we have at our disposal. So if I make payments every month, um, the same payments, same date, the same time every month. Why do I need to log into internet banking? Why can't I just send a WhatsApp that says pay the usual? Or if my cell phone bill is decreasing uh, over time, we should know I could be using a competitor. So predictive means proactive and not reactive. And I think being proactive is all part of what user research is about. Um, but we know now we've got a lot of data and we're just not using it. Um, customers, they don't want you to ask them, they want you to know them. And, uh, you know, in a call center these days, we don't need to know, if a, we don't need to ask customer what the experience was like. We can use AI to tell us through resolution and sentiment analytics if the customer is happy or not and whether their, their query was resolved or not. Clutter, clutter continues to grow and people don't have time to read what we send them. So, I mean, the, we, are, we are just... So far, the world is just so much full of information overload, um, so much so that Microsoft removed their clutter box, inbox because everything was going into it. 
Um, our core business is also changing. Apple used to sell hardware and software, and now they focus on TV, gaming, and payments. Discovery used to look after our health, and now they're a bank, and cellular networks are selling funeral cover. So we're designing these digital solutions for customers when maybe we don't understand for customers that we don't understand, and maybe for products that we don't understand or we're not familiar with. And we're missing opportunities within our, our own industries. So an example, two examples there is um, a, a bank launched the purchase of data via WhatsApp before the telcos, or, or Samsung launched card pay before any of the banks. So we're so focused on trying to deliver what we do today and what we do to do today well and digitizing what we do today, we don't think about the, the opportunities that, um, um, that we should be thinking about. So the next thing I want to say is that companies are not moving fast enough. Um, this is just I saw it on, on, on LinkedIn last night. Uh, and this is just a, someone posted it about a, a boarding pass. This is a, a boarding pass and this is a lean boarding pass. And, uh, you, you know, customers are on, a, on a daily basis are forced to accept our mediocrity. Um, and they don't have enough of a say. If you think about just this, this example here, how many of us have traveled and looked at these boarding passes and struggled to read them and struggled to find our seat numbers or the boarding time or the boarding gate on them? Um, and I don't need users to tell me that the bottom one is a better design. I know that. I need, them for mo I need them to motivate for me to get this design implemented. I need the cabin crew to tell me the impact of people sitting in the wrong seats because they, they get confused. I need the cabin crew to tell me how difficult it is for them to read the boarding passes when checking people in. I need the actuaries to tell me the cost of flights being late because of passengers being late because they're getting their times wrong. Um, I need to understand from my elder passengers um, or reading impaired people, how many times they have to ask a stranger to look at these boarding passes. And I need, to, I need to motivate why these things need to change. Some of the things that we offer our clients in our, in our service delivery or in our digital channels or anything these days, they're obvious. They're things that we should be doing, but we just don't do. And for, for whatever the reasons are, um, and in the business world, we have to show value. We have to show efficiency. We have to, we have to show that it's going to help our, 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 our financial situation, um, and, and we can only do that by doing proper research and getting feedback from all stakeholders, not just the end client or customers, but the, um, the, the people that help us in, in, enable um, and the, these products and services to our clients, which is often our call center staff, our branch staff, our, any staff that is client-facing, they have a lot of insight and answers, and, and we often neglect them. Um, so some background to research. Um, I said that if you're not interested in the background, then maybe you're not in the right uh, meetup. But uh, I got a question before we came in today um, from Giovanni, and he wanted to know, uh, just uh, he asked me to give some feedback on the state of the industry when it comes to user research and SA, specifically um, in relation to, to, to UX and digital design. And my answer is shocking. Um, and the reason why I say that is, is that if I look at sort of the companies that we work with and the sort of the requests we get, a lot of the research requests for UX are very reactive. It's very, um, it's not working. We implemented it. No one's, no one's using it. Um, we implemented it, but um, people are complaining or whatever the, whatever the reasons are. Um, it's reactive more than proactive. So if we look at the marketing budget and the marketing spend for user research that we get, uh, sorry, the, the spend that we get for user research, a lot of it has come from, a lot of it has come from the marketing guys, the product guys, um, and the budgets, if you compare it to the budgets coming from the actual digital teams is really small and insignificant compared to the, the, the other teams. And those teams are answer, asking the same questions we need but it's not focused on our digital users, so it's just general. And, and, and I think um, it is getting better. We are starting to see companies do a lot more in um, uh, user research in the design teams, but it's definitely not enough. And if you compare organizational spend on user research or market research um, to from the traditional sort of guys that requested compared to the digital teams, it's really, um, you know, um, 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 the, the, the gap is huge. So we started to see it better, but it's, it's not where it needs to be.
All right. So where are we going wrong with, 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 with market research or user research? And what are the problems that, that people have with user research? And uh, I'll, I'll just, just start off by cost. It costs money. Um, and yes, it does cost money. And I just put there, so does toothpaste, but you have to buy it. So it's the same thing. Um, you know, yes, it adds to the budget, but the value will always outweigh the spend. And I think if you think about your digital implementations, failure or, re or rework or lost opportunity is way more expensive and damaging than the research budget. I think the problem is, is that within definitely the UX world or the digital world, and this is specific to South Africa, um, we, 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 we don't put it in, we don't forward plan. And it's always during a project, we're using budget from somewhere to do user research. And uh, just like we pay for staff, just like we pay for our facilities, just like we pay for our tech and our developers and our designers, we need to pay for, 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 for market research. It's often done incorrectly. And I think in our industry, there's not enough emphasis on the training around user research. I think I've seen so many um, and projects where it's just ineffective and then companies lose um, confidence in, in, in user research. And um, I think that that also doesn't help us and it hurts us. It's often an afterthought, but research should be the before, during, and afterthought. Um, and it can delay things. And excuse the, the word there, but that's not the truth. If it's part of your design process and it's properly done, and uh, it's, it's, it's built into how you do things in your framework, it should never delay anything. Um, and there's no follow-up. So I also wrote there, on to the next thing, so says Agile, whoever that guy might be. Um, so what I'm saying there is, is that we do, sometimes when we are doing the testing, we do the designs, we do the implementations, we do the testing, and we move on. And we don't actually continually see that what we're doing is working, what we're doing is what people um, um, want and changing, using, and following up on, 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 on what we've implemented. So very often, it's, it's research is done, but it's, but it's not done in a iterative manner, um, and we, we focus on the next design, the next feature, the next product, the next innovation, um, and we don't actually focus on are what we've got in place actually working, are they efficient, are they doing what we need them to do. And where we do not doing it properly. So this is just an example of a, a tree map where we ask someone to go in and find something in a navigation. And you can see in this example here, it's not, not so clear on purpose, but we asked the users to go uh, for a specific task in a UX test to find something. And these are all the places that they went to and all the decisions that they had to make in the navigation. And you can see that very, it's just a mess. It's just a big mess of people going everywhere and actually not finding what they need to find. And this is after competitor reviews, guerrilla testing, subject matter experts, internal business reviews, where everyone's going, that's the winner navigation, it works, it represents our business. Um, and very often because the people that are involved are biased. If you work for a company, you are biased just because you understand that business. If you are involved in the design of it, you are biased because you created it. If you're part of the business, you, you are biased in that the, what you're looking at is the words that you're familiar with, but not necessarily the words that your customers are familiar with. And often we use product names and terms that people, when you talk to them in user research, don't use. And that's one of the biggest gaps between what we implement versus what, what customers want. So yes, you've got all these internal things that you can do, but it's flawed in a way and that can lead to the wrong things being done. So where does you, user research fit into our process? Um, so everyone's got a process. Well, whatever that process is, um, people, people have a process. And uh, it doesn't matter what your process is, but what's important is to design where it fits in. Make sure it's proactive and not reactive. Plan for it, budget for it up front, just like everything else. And uh, I know this is a fact that a lot of people try to have um, within organizations in terms of getting research implemented, because that's the fact that we have, but it all starts and ends with research. So ultimately, you need buy-in from the top. Um, you need to create a framework for it, and you need to make sure that it's budgeted for well in advance so that it's just part of the process and it's nothing new and it's nothing that you have to fight for. So this is just an example of a 
design process and maybe not a it doesn't have to be a digital design process but you'd go through it and you would identify as you go through who the user is the brand the what the design the prioritization the execution or, or whatever your process is where does research fit in where do we need it and what is this role and what does it need to do for us and uh, i think that's why i say this the difference between proactive user research and reactive user research um, and i think in terms of this is proactive research and understanding how does it fit into your process. So if you are using Agile and you've got sprints, can you do user research in such short periods of time? Absolutely. But you also got to think about the bigger the bigger picture and the bigger things because that's just one small little piece of design that's part of a bigger, um, a bigger ecosystem. If we look at uh, uh, um, the design process and to keep it simple, iterative-based design. You've got to continually be involved in the users in your design process, whatever that process is. So it doesn't ma matter whether you're doing this as a sprint, whether you're prototyping, whether you, you know, you're assessing your entire digital offering, you have to iterate. And that can go in both directions. It doesn't matter which direction it goes. So it's might start off with the business going to design, get customer feedback, feedback to the business, because maybe what the business assumed in the beginning was wrong. Or it could start with the users, understanding the customer, then going to business, then going into design, or it can go the other way, users, design, um, reflection. And the reflection means that it's not just about what the users tell you, and it's not just about what the users want, because ultimately, the business needs to achieve its business goals. And you know, user-centric is user-first, it's a user-based user, it's a user -based approach, but you have to also include what the business needs to be achieving. Otherwise, they are not going to be brought into the process and you won't satisfy um, the stakeholders and their needs. And you won't get buy-in. Okay, so if we move on to methodologies, and the next thing is we want to look at is um, choosing the correct methodology. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief background. If, 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 if not everyone's familiar with research, there's basically two different types of research that you can do. You can do quantitative research, which is the numbers, the, um, doing surveys and things like that. And you can do qualitative research, which is the why. So the quantitative is the what, and then the qualitative is more about, about why people do things they do, um, their behavior and their needs and all of that type of thing. And then you've got something in the middle, which is called something in between. Um, and that's actually where I started my career, because I didn't start as a uh, a guru in market research. Um, and I kind of, in the beginning, I didn't really know what I was doing as I was navigating through it and I was figuring it out. And uh, I didn't have the background from a, from a, from a, from an education perspective, from, um, you know, the methodologies and, and all of those things to quantitative and qualitative. So I was in the dipstick mode and, and, and something in between mode where it's a bit of a variation between using quant and qual, not using such big numbers, but involving users the whole time um, and, and, and to make sure that I always got the input into whatever I was designing. Um, and I, and, and I, I had very good knowledge of my users and I could answer any stakeholder question about my users in the design process because they, I, I was always engaging with them. And uh, that's why it doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to be there and it needs to be part of your process. So I... Uh, um, so that's, yeah. Um, so, so in terms of this... You know, what's important to understand that is if you're talking about quantitative and you're talking about predictive um, research, it needs to be statistically relevant. And uh, there you need to start looking at margins of error and your sample size of your markets is very important. So there you can't interview 50 people and be confident that if you put this into the market, they're going to like what you've got or whatever your um, um, research, your user research was about. It's all about the confidence level and, 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 and how inaccurate the research that you do could be based on your sample sizes. And the statistical calculations in terms of what sample sizes you need to be 95% or 99% confident, confident in terms of the outputs of what your user research is. And people use that for when they're doing these polls, for like when um, you're voting for government or uh, and, 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 and things like that in terms of who, who's going to win. Um, there you need the, the numbers in order to um, be sure and be confident in the answers that you're getting. 
Whereas, and, and once again, you can do quantitative without doing the big numbers, but you need to treat it as more dipstick. Um, then we've got qualitative. And qualitative is, once again, you don't need large numbers for, for qualitative, but you still need to evaluate what the size of, 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 of the sample that you need is. And if you look here, this is just a basic graph showing you value that you get in versus cost and time. And what you find with this qualitative research is that um, – you, as you go along, you find that the, the value that you get in goes down and the cost in time becomes very expensive. So when a lot of times when people ask me about UX testing and, and usability testing and how many users do you need, and, and then you know, when you're saying you could give them good feedback on their, on, their, on their designs with 12 users that go, no, that's impossible, and you get a lot of the, 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 the market research guys saying, well, that's not statistically valid and things like that. But it's all about the value that you get versus how much you spend in. And, and very often, you could get, with very small samples, 80% of what you need to know, and the 20% needs to come from somewhere else. And obviously, these days, we need to, we need to supplement our, um, our, our research and, and what we get with, with data and analytics and all of those things. OK, so the next thing to look at is the research questions. And that is, what are you actually trying to find out? And this could be a lot of different things, but I just gave some examples here. This is not an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to give you some examples for context. Um, one is to learn about your users. So you're looking to understand their needs, their problems, their personalities, their life stages, or their motivations or behavior. The next thing that you might want to be um, finding out is to research a specific question or problem that you've got. So i.e., your design's not performing well. People are not using it. Um, you, you, you're, you're in the prototyping mode and you want to test out different um, designs and want to know which design is better. You want to measure the appetite for a new product or a new feature. Um, or you're designing or digitizing a product or service that wasn't digitized before. Or maybe it's just a, a manual process or, 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 um, or, or service. We might want to measure the experience of our, of our, of our channels. We might want to measure the usability of our channels, and that's the success, time, navigation, ease of use, awareness, and many more. Or you might want to design a journey and design an experience and use customers to help you and assist you in doing that. So it's very important to know what you're trying to establish in order to decide what is the best user research method for you in order to answer the question that you've got. So if we look at research and practice, um, as I said, it should always be an iterative approach. Um, our customers' needs and wants are changing all the time. So if I had to do an exercise now to find out some of these things about their needs, their problems, and their personalities, if I did it right now, um, this month, and I had done the same exercise in October last year, it's completely changed because our environments have changed. And, and obviously with COVID, uh, um, it was a big game changer, but but without COVID, even even without that, we've got other things that are going on in our environment. Launch of, launch of new competitors, launch of new products. Um, we've got things like 5G being implemented, and that's changing the landscape. And so you can't just rely on a study from a year ago or two years ago. If you want to know about needs, problems, life stages, you've got to continually um, research that and continually update what you're doing. It can't be a once-off thing because I interviewed someone in January by December, their world could have changed. Um, okay, so then once we've, once we've got the question, we look at, and this is typically, I would say, you need to try and answer these questions. There obviously could be many more questions, but this is what I focus on first. Number one, who are we designing for? Number two, what is our goal? What are we trying to achieve from this user research? What, are we, what, are we, what is the output that we want? What answer do we what, what answer do we want to get? What are we going to do with this information? It's very important. It's like, yes, we can research user needs. Why? What do we, what do we want to do with it and, and how are we going to use it? Um, this is about what we want to know and what we're measuring. Obviously, budget is important. Um, I just said, yeah, large or small, but we have to be realistic. I can't do segmentation of personas or, or, or developing of all these things for, 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 for a very small amount because it's not going to be done properly. Um, and then you need to choose a different approach even if you've got small budgets. Um, but budgets should not be a barrier for you to um, doing research. There's always a way and a means to do it. What's the timetable that you've got is very important and how many iterations. So if we want to do 
uh, if we want to understand life stages for our customers, how often are we going to do this? Because is it just a once-off thing, or are we going to do that frequently? And, and these are the type of things that questions we get all the time. So you need to answer these questions, and I'm going to get to how you can do that. Um, so these are just some methodologies out there, and yes, there's about – 100 and to 1,000 methodologies that we can use. So I, I'm not here today to talk you through all the methodologies that there is. I just want to point out a few of the common ones that we're using right now. So obviously from quantitative, you've got your usability testing, you've got online panels and surveys, and I know usability testing is mentioned um, in all three, qualitative, observational, and quantitative. That is not a mistake. That is that is that is supposed to be like that. Um, I think that there's a number of factors that, that so, so sorry, just back to um, a lot of these things. Um, you, you know, there's a number of factors that go into what you would choose and the methodology you would choose. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, an idea of how to, how to go through that process now, a little bit of a funnel or filter. But essentially from a, a, a quantitative, it's panels, surveys, those type of things. Um, telling us the story, the qualitative, it's, it's once again usability testing. That's where you get now focus groups, diary studies, interviews, workshops um, and mystery shopping and, and, and things like that or competitor benchmarks. And then from an observational perspective, I think observational, and I've, I've included data under observational, but you get your, your typical eth ethnography, which is basically observation data. And it's amazing in, in terms of what you, you, you find and what you see when you observe people. Um, when I look at usability testing, I don't get, um, I get more information by watching people than by, look, by, by asking them questions or, um, or looking at their success rates or anything like that. Um, and then you've got internal data. And yes, we've got the site in analytics and things like that and heat mapping and stuff. But we've also got behavioral data. And behavioral data is very important. Um, I think that we, we, we need to use this data more. And I think companies are struggling to unlock the value of this data. And it is a big question that we, we get in a lot of meetings is how to unlock that value. Um, and then I just put out this common, there's so many different UX testing methods, but these are some of the, the common ones that we use is task-based evaluations, tree jack, which is sort of, that's what I was showing you in that navigation example earlier, card sorting, client sensing, walkthroughs, and, and A-B testing. And the list goes on and on. Okay, so, so just some considerations um, for UX research. Uh, I, I, there's a long list. I don't want to go through all of them, so I just wanted to focus on on, on three of them that are important to me. Um, one is you can't test your own work in school. You didn't mark your own homework. And as I said before, you're biased and you're not objective. So if you're too close to it, um, you land up defending the design as opposed to being critical of the design. The other thing is that you're not the user and you can't shortcut the design process um, very often it's about opinions within our teams and that's not user research or, or, or um, maybe we go downstairs and do some guerrilla testing. But once again, everyone in the building works for the same organization. They're all familiar with the product services and terminologies. So you have to be very, very um, careful. And then the last thing is, do you have the necessary research skills? So where we see research being done badly, it's very, it can have big implications for the business because they're using that as, as their source of truth, their source of knowledge, their source of you are the, 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 um, the you, you're playing the role of the customer for us. And if it's flawed and given the wrong recommendations, it might have a big implication for the business. So, you know, it, it's also good to realize that you need to have a mentor. You need to work with people if you're not that familiar with research who can help you through the process. Um, I think that Typical research is very different from UX research, but you still need to have those fundamentals in place. Um, uh, yeah. All right, so let's give you a practical example. Um, let's say you've got the following problem. You build a loan application, but your clients are not using it. It's a typical one, and it doesn't have to be just a loan application. It could be any type of thing that you build. Uh, it could be uh, you build a claim, a, a, a claim feature on your app, and, and no one's using it. It's a, it's, a, it's a typical type of problem that we get with our clients. The first thing that you need to do is you need to make assumptions, and you need to you need to strategize as to what do we think the problem could be. So before we start our research approach, before we start our objectives, before we start um, 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 how we're going to go about this 
the, the, this, this process, we need to look at why. Why do we think no one's using this loan application? Could it be they're not aware of it? Could it be that it's not easy to use? Could it be that they don't want to use it? Or it doesn't fit into their process and they're comfortable with the current process? Could it be that um, we're not answering the questions that they have in that journey? You haven't set expectations. They don't have confidence in using digital channels. It doesn't fulfill their needs. Um, there are so many things and hypotheses that you can develop. But in business today, I think we, we're pretty good at knowing close to what the issues are and why people are not using it. So we need to look at people who are using it and why are they using it. So if we get a very small take-up, we need to speak to those people and understand why and how do they get to know about it and learn about it and use it and were they just the first adopters or um, and then we need to establish people that are not using it and why they're not using it. Okay. Um, so I do realize I did go through the uh, different type of methodologies quite quickly, and not everyone might be familiar with these methodologies, but these are things that you can go and, and research on, uh, on your own. Okay, so then we go through a methodology selection process, and essentially here we need to answer all of those questions that I'd previously asked. So from an objective perspective, from a business perspective, what's the business problem or the business goal? And very often, the business problem or the business goal might not be aligned to the, the user's problem or the user's goal or the design team's problem or the design team's goal. So it's very important to understand what are they trying to achieve as a business. Then from a research perspective, what do you want to learn from your customers? Because depending on what you want to learn, will have a big input into the methodology that you, that you end up using. The next thing is who. And uh, it's about which customers, which, uh, which segments, um, and what their profiles are. And it's very important this because in selecting a methodology, you've got to use a methodology that is appropriate for an audience. So one, I'll give you an interesting thing that's happened during, during COVID. So obviously we're not doing face-to-face -face research at the moment and we're doing it all online and through digital channels. And a lot of the uh, markets that we um, that we that that, are, that we research for our clients are the lowest segment markets, and what's quite interesting is, is that we we're forced to doing these tests with people in their own environment. So normally, when conducting a usability test, we've got a very fancy lab in Sandton. We've got all the tech, all the functionality, and we've got the fastest internet that that you can get. Um, these users come in, and we say yes, we're getting users that are not that digitally proficient. We get them to test out our clients' applications and things like that, and we give feedback. And we normally get very good feedback, but now we're doing this testing remotely. And one of the interesting things on, on, on remote user testing is we've got a lot of problems and, and teething issues when we are, are, are doing this remote testing with, with these users, such as their electricity goes down or the internet goes on and off, or the internet is slow, or the internet is down, and then it comes back up. And you know, and we, we, we're trying to navigate through all of these remote issues. And, and one of the learnings is, is that that's the user's reality. That's their real environment. Those are the challenges that they need to go through on a day-to-day -day basis in using our, our, um, our digital platforms that we've, that we've built for them. So yes, they might want and have access to our banking platform, but it's not the way in which we access the banking platform from the offices, and their constraints are very different to ours. And I feel that we get in, it might be frustrating some clients when we're halfway through a session and then it ends because the user's internet cuts out or the electricity cuts out, but it is completely realistic of what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis and is making the insights and what we get in a lot richer. So that's the who. And, you, you know, the, the sample size and how many people always depends on the who, and that's where you've got to start. And then there's other factors like size of the project. Is it a small project or is it a big project? What, are we, what have we got appetite for? Our timelines, our budget. And, and, and how many iterations we're doing. Very often, clients have a budget or they don't. And when they come to us and they don't have a budget, they do have a budget. And sometimes it's about not understanding what it costs to do proper user research and what are the very different options that they've got for, for, for how much it costs. And then lastly, you start looking at your methodology, which is qual or quant or both, 
A lot of the projects we do now are mixed methodology projects. Access to users, can you get access to users? So for instance, if we're testing people now with feature phones on USSD, can we get access to those people? Can we test them via, um, via remote platforms? And then which, which method is best and most appropriate for what we're trying to, to achieve given all of these factors? Now, there might be many more factors that you consider in your um, methodology selection process, but these are the main ones that, that you would need to look at in order to um, come up with the right methodology. Now, the big question, okay, so how do we then, once we've got all of this information, how do we then go and now formulate the, the, what we're going to do? So I just designed a very basic funnel, what I'll call a funnel, and might, might not look like a funnel, but, and basically it's just, um, very basic to guide you and help you in terms of how we go about it. So you've got your problem, client not using the loan application. You've got your assumptions. It's not easy to use. Users is more comfortable with the current method. We don't understand our customer. Now, depending on what your assumptions are, like if you don't understand your customer versus we know it's not easy to use and it's very clunky, that will tell you what you need to do. So then you've got to take your factors in. You've got a budget. I've got 100K. It's a small project, and I need, I need feedback. You know, we're launching in two weeks. It's, uh, I need feedback, feedback quick. And all of these things will give you what you need in order to start designing the right methodology. So, for instance, if you, have to, if you need feedback by next week, it might not be possible to do for instance, usability testing, but you can have an expert review it and give you guidance and tips on small things you can do to improve your design before you launch. So you take these objectives and these factors, your, your ease of use, user needs, and digital usage, these are hypotheses, and you say, well, what are the right methodologies for, um, for getting the answers to these questions? So ease of use, UX testing, user needs, interviews. You need to speak to people. You need to understand people. Um, you can't get that through a survey asking them um, questions where they've got to select an option. It's this qualitative insight that, that, that based on conversation that is really going to help you understand what their needs are. And then if you don't understand the digital usage, well, then a quant survey would suffice for that. Now, given so these are just different methodologies that you can use for different objectives. And once again, we can debate them, we can brainstorm them. You have to look at this, these factors now. I've only got a 100K budget. I can't do all three. Uh, it's a small project, and, and, and we don't have a lot of time. So what are we going to do? And there we look at our, we consider our user profile and, 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 who, and, and who we're going to be doing this one. We evaluate our options, and we come up with a recommendation. And in this case, for this the, the, this recommendation, we put a usability test as an example. And once again, that might not be um, um, the, uh, the, right, the right methodology, but the reason why we would have chosen a usability test here is because, number one, UX testing can help you understand ease of use. Number two, you've got users there. You can understand their user needs. And number three, we can also look at their digital usage in a small manner, but this is something that you're going to have to take offline as well, because if you don't understand your, your, user, your, your client's digital usage, that's a bigger project and that's a bigger need, and it's not going to help you for your loan application um, um, process. So it's a funnel that you go through in order to get to the right methodology, but obviously you need to understand these methodologies very well um, and understand what's appropriate for the different type of objectives that you've got. So that's just a small funnel that I built. Um, and then just some closing thoughts from me. Um, I just wanted to say that we do live in a predictive eco economy and we've got data available that captures, you know, everything that your customer does. You are able to anticipate their needs. Um, we live in a data-driven economy and are you building that into your journey? Two, don't just research your users. What's very important is to also look at your, 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 the employees, research your stakeholders, Research the frontline staff, front-facing staff, and research your suppliers. The next thing is, what is the role of the researcher? Very often, and it's assumption that you as a UX researcher represent your target audience, but you don't. UX is a process to get an answer, and you're not the user. So, you know, if you don't, if you are a, a, a UX or UI or developer or whatever your role is in these organizations, um, you should know your customers, their capabilities, their fears, their issues, their needs. Um, and this is an ongoing process. 
And if you don't, you've got a problem. And that is where you seriously need to start researching and engaging with your customers. And the last thing is you need a change management strategy. A lot of the problems for the research uh, problem that I had here, clients not using a loan application, is because the company is implemented without a proper change management strategies. People are creatures of habit and don't change without motivation. And they don't want to change um, what is working or the way that they do things today just because it's more efficient for an organization. As people, we never change, but we adapt. And I think that that's very important. And if you think about that and use that in your design approach, how you get your, your clients to adapt to what you want them to do, it really is, is a game changer. And just to end off with COVID, I think we need to realize that the need for people interaction, the need for UX is, is, is critical in, 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 in today because what's happening is people that were apprehensive to go to these channels in the first place are being forced into these channels. And we really need to understand their needs um, because today we're designing for their children, not necessarily them. And with COVID, we need to make sure that we're designing for everyone. And uh, that is my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Gary. Yeah. Gary, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now. Just stop sharing. Yeah, got it. Thank you, Gary. That was a thorough deep dive into user research, and it's a privilege to have you sharing with us. Now, we've had a ton of questions, so I'd like to actually get straight into that. Okay, the first off, first one that we're going to go into is by Trevain van Niekerk, and he says, do you think testing in person will be relevant slash needed moving forward? As passionate as a passionate UX designer, working with people is my passion but clients no longer want to be exposed to risk. Is online moderated research getting us the data that we actually need? So the answer is, is yes and no. Um, I think we can all, you know, we can all, we can all attest to like even tonight, we say networking after this, but networking in person versus online is very different. And I think that yes, we we can get. Uh, for me, I've been wanting to do more um, more uh, remote user testing, um, and this has enabled us to do that. And we're learning, and it's got its challenges. But you, we are getting great data and information. But it's never going to take away from the need for human interaction and working with your people, um, working with people. In, 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 a, in, a, in a close environment like a boardroom or a UX lab or, a, or, or in a place of where they are utilizing your products and services. So that face-to-face -face value, you, you, you will never supplement in, 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 in online, but online is going to allow us to do things cheaper and more frequently and get more answers to, to questions that we need. So before, where, um, where you would where, where you would need to, where you, you would need to um, and have a big project and a big budget to get feedback, you can do it very quickly using remote testing. But you will still need that online interaction. All right, brilliant. Thank you. Next question is from Borg Christensen, and he says, "How do user researchers most effectively communicate findings to designers in such a way that users' needs can be easily translated?" into an interface? That, that is a, that's an easy one for me. Um, and, uh, um, you know, that is, number one is, first of all, involving them in the, 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 the user research process because very often, um, like for us, we, we could get, like, as an example, developers that don't understand why we want to change something from the left to the right, and that's going to take time. That's going to take money. We've got other more important things, and it's really not a big deal. Um, but when they see people interacting with it and when they're part of the process and when they get the feedback, they are more bought in, and, and designers can then actually start engaging more with people to buy into this value. I think the other thing is it's about the, the visualization of the feedback of the results. In my company, we're very visual, it's very engaging, it's very interactive, and make it interactive, put them as part of the process. But the other thing is it can't just be a report at the end of the day. And it needs to be, and that's part of what the Papio side of our business is, is how do you then action it? 
And, and how do you decide what's important and what's not important and what we need to prioritize? Okay. Our next question is from Andy underscore X on Twitter. And she says, should companies focus on upskilling designers on the user research side? Do we know enough and are we doing this effectively or are we simply ticking a box? So, so I definitely think companies should be upskilling designers on the, on the user research side. So the answer for me is absolutely yes. But should they be solely responsible for conducting the, the user research? The answer is no, and I'll tell you why. Some designers or UX designers or, or, or UI designers, they're great designers. They might not necessarily have the skills or the right and personality to engage with people to get the right outputs. So people need to fundamentally, yes, they need to be upskilled in it. They need to be part of the process. And and for those that are um, that that do that can pick up those skills or it's part of their repertoire, they should be in, um, 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 doing it. But not everyone should be doing it. We can't all do everything or play every role. All right, that makes sense. Next question. What percentage of a company's budget should be spent on user research in relation to activities such as user experience design or business analysis? Um, it's a difficult one because it, it, it varies so much because, uh, you know, a lot of the, these days the, uh, the processes that companies follow is not sort of traditional and uh, the, the makeup of it is, is not um, the same or standard. So it's, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, I mean, we used to have a number, so we used to tell them, tell them that they used to have to spend, um, I think it was 8% of the, of their, of their spend or 10% of their spend on, on, on UX research, UX research, not market research per se, but, um, it's changed so much. So it's, 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 it's quite a difficult one. And I think the, the reality of it, it also depends on, you know, you could have a client, you could have a, a company that has, you know, 20 feature teams where you can have a company that has 200 feature teams. So it really, it really does depend. I think what's important is you need to have a framework for it. It needs to be part of your process and you need to make sure you get in value from it, from what you're doing. And that will determine the value that, that you get determines what, what you need to spend. Okay, fair enough. Taking a step back, a question from Giovanni Facario says, why has the traditional role of the business analyst not evolved to include user research? Should companies replace business analysts with UX analysts? I think they're completely different roles and they come from completely different perspectives. And, and no, they, they shouldn't replace um, business uh, um, analysts with UX analysts. And I'll tell you why. It's because we all have our own priorities in business. So you've got a developer and they've got their priority of what they need to achieve. You've got a business analyst which needs to take you know, the business requirements and system requirements and all of that stuff and put it together. And they need to worry about um, those type of things, but as a as a sort of UX designer and UX researcher, those none of those constraints should matter to you because otherwise your design and your research is always going to be flawed based on we can't do this because. And uh, it's very important that the role of your UX person or the researcher does remain independent to those other type of roles where they've got other agendas that they need to fulfill. Right. Next question. Is there a golden ratio of number of researchers, number of designers, and number of developers within a digital team? Sure. It's very, once again, it, 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 you can't answer a question like that because it depends from company to company. It depends on how they're structured. It depends on, on, on a lot of things. But what we find is, though, like as an example, we could have, it depends on the, the volume and frequency and requirements. So in a team, you might have a, a team that's got quite a, a big feature set that they work on, and you need a full-time business analyst, you need a full-time UX designer, you need a full-time UI designer, and you need a full-time developer just for one team or squad, you could have um, a, a, a another environment where it's different and you have a UX designer um, um, playing a role 
uh, um, a single person that is part of many squads and offering the advice and, and the, the, the expertise to many squads in that process. So it really does depend, and there is no golden number. I think, once again, it's like how many developers do you need to implement the system? It's, 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 it's not an, a question that you could just answer without understanding that specific company's unique requirements. I think in terms of the... Um, the, the the ratios and things like that, I, I, I wouldn't want to, to put a number there. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Gary. So, Gary, you have absolutely crushed it tonight, and thank you so much for being involved in this meetup and sharing your knowledge with us in the theoretical section as well as in the Q&A. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with Gary, you can go ahead and get in touch with him on LinkedIn. Um, do you have any closing thoughts, Gary? No, I'd like to just thank everyone. I think um, it, it's probably sparked a lot of the, um, questions and debates and things, and I think it's just good to to discuss these things because uh, I honestly think what I've spoken about tonight or, or the whole role of UX design in the in, in the process has been taboo for a lot a, 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 a lot of years, and, and and I feel that it's time for us as UX. Um, people to to rise and show the value that we that we add in the business. So that's just my my, my last thought. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. And reach out to Gary on LinkedIn using the link in the show notes as well as the one here. Thanks, Gary. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending uh, this user this user testing masterclass UX Joburg. Before we close up the evening, I would like to remind you that this evening's event is going to be, well, has been recorded, and it will be available on our YouTube channel in full. So you can go along there and watch last month's customer journey mapping UX masterclass with Yaku Fanden Hierfer. And if you'd like, you can also go and find this month's user testing masterclass on our YouTube channel. Then the podcast, the short form version of this week's uh, masterclass. You can also find it on wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever. So you can find it there. We've also included a, a link in the show notes, so you can go find it there. Okay, so next month we will be having Darren Hood, 20 plus years of solution-driven UX experience, adjunct professor, conference speaker, PhD student, and podcaster. Darren Hood is a powerhouse, and we're going to be having him on UX Joburg next month. So go and sign up for that now. You can find him on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash DW Hood. Okay, so I'm pumped for that. So sign in and book for that. Okay, and before we close up, I would like to thank uh, UX Joburg's sponsor. Sand Dollar Design, digitally focused, world-class experiences. And don't forget about the promotion that they're currently running. Book a free consultation with Sand Dollar Design and get their team of user experience strategists, researchers, and designers to review your app, website, or system. Or get advice on how to grow the UX maturity in your organization. Request a consultation on their website, sanddollardesign.co.za. For now, that's me. Have a wonderful rest of your week and the remaining month, and we'll see you again in August. Bye. Well, no, in July. Cool. See you in July. Bye.